It's hysterical. Amen. Well, shalom, everyone, and blessings. It is time once again for a Jew and Gentile discuss. Uh, it is Friday. It is April uh, 14th, I believe it is. Yep, April 14th. It is the eighth day of counting. Uh, tonight, we will um, go into the ninth day of counting as we are ascending to Sinai, as we are ascending to Jerusalem for um, for the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. Did I get it wrong? Brother Mitch, are we on track? Uh, I didn't hear the date you you called. Oh, it's April 14th right now. It is the uh, eighth day of counting. Tonight will be the ninth day of counting. I believe I I believe I am on track um, uh, with that. And uh, yeah, we are ascending, amen, ascending up to the covenant relationship with Yeshua, to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to the giving of Torah at Sinai. So we have lots of reasons to celebrate and look forward to uh, in the next coming weeks here. Uh, now, if you guys have been uh, following us, we uh, last week we went over a... Um, a video that Solberg did on Passover and Easter, and now we're getting back to his book of Galatians. We are on his video number three, and we are in Galatians chapter three. We're picking up with verse 10 today. And one thing that um, I had an aha moment just uh, really just yesterday, and it really caused me to dig in, and, and I should have remember this and known this, but a friend of mine helped remind me of this uh, the other day. And Brother Mitch said this way back, if you guys can remember, way back at the beginning of this series, uh, he said, now watch, Rob, watch when we use the word law. Not every time you use the word law, is it going to mean the law of Moshe? You know, and that's oftentimes the assumption that everyone does. Once they see the word law, they think law of Moshe. And uh, one of the helpful hints that I learned from a friend of mine the other day, and I was mapping it out yesterday, and it just kept opening things wide open, is when you look in the Greek and uh, you see that there is no definite article, the, next to namos, next to law, you are going to have to really check it out because most likely it does not mean the law of Moshe. It is talking about oral traditions, extra biblical laws, so forth. When it has the definite article there, the law, now we can look more into, oh, it's the law of Moshe being spoken of. So uh, something that Brother Mitch mentioned, you know, way back in the beginning, and I just kind of lost track of it, forgot about it. One thing for sure, if you haven't ever caught that tip uh, that was given by Brother Mitch or, or anybody else, um, one thing we know for sure is whatever it is in Galatians, it's a perverting of the law of Moshe that is happening. So no matter how much you, you know, uh, want to look at it, it is a perverted way of looking or dealing with the law of Moshe is what Paul is dealing with. And that's not something that Solberg is even addressing, and that really needs uh, to be brought out. But we hope to bring a lot more of this out today as we are continuing in his series. But Brother Mitch, how are you doing today? How's your week been going? Uh, well, I'm uh, glad that uh, Pesach is, is over. We've had a, a, a wonderful celebration at, at synagogue for all of the days and uh, multiple services, etc. cetera. But uh, the, the joke of Pesach, and I'll share this with everybody, is that we know that through a combination of uh, Moshe and Aharon contending uh, with Pharaoh, it was all about let my people go. Right. And during these eight days, we've all been eating matzah, unleavened bread. And now after uh, Hag Hamatzot has been finished, uh, the joke remains, it's still let my people go. <laughs> so that might take some people uh, right. a while to get it. Um, for my ethnic cousins out there, you I know you got it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh anyway but uh the things are good we're marching forward to uh now my august 21 departing here date to uh to leave and uh, go off to uganda i'm uh waiting for an answer from uh someone that i know uh, before I actually purchased the ticket, and 
and uh, that should be uh, by the end of the month. So uh, exciting times all the way around, ministry, personally, uh, every which way in my life with uh, even the people who are now accusing me of uh, not knowing what I'm talking about because of my Easter post. <laughs> right, right. So uh, anyway, I, if anyone's watching this video, you can find it on my page. And I just urge you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the tender mercies of God, to read slowly and carefully at what I have written regarding the source of the word that is translated into English that is causing all of the confusion and contention. And I'm not the one that is confused nor conflicted. Right. I know exactly what I said, why I said it. And uh, in part, it's doing what it was intended to do is to raise questions, but some just continue to have a knee-jerk reaction and don't get it. And we'll just leave it at that. Sure, sure. Well, everyone, let's go ahead and dive into the video. Um, you know, we are a little bit pressed for time uh, today. We like to uh, do our best to keep it around an hour. Sometimes <laughs> we go a little bit longer, but uh, we just enjoy uh, our time together so much. But yeah, let's go ahead and we'll jump into the video to make themselves righteous through works of the law or works of the flesh are cursed. And Paul backs that up with a quote from the Torah. He's citing Deuteronomy 27, 26 here to show that everyone who relies on works of the law is under the curse of the law. And he's showing his readers that this isn't a new idea. It comes from the Torah itself. And he's contrasting that with the blessing of Abraham that's given to all who trust God including Gentiles, as he mentioned specifically in verse 8. In other words, contrary to what the Judaizers were teaching, the law can't justify or save anyone. Why? Because the breaking of any command of the law brought a curse on the person who broke it. So Deuteronomy 11 says, verse 26, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. So the commandments this verse is talking about are the law that God gave to Israel through Moses. It's what scripture calls the law of Moses. And the law of Moses served as the terms of the, of the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. And that covenant came with Let's blessings right and curses, which are, which are... What's that? Let's stop right here for a okay. moment. All right, so <laughs> he, he's bringing up uh, Deuteronomy 11, as specifically verse 26. The focus in that section of scripture is only and always going after other gods now how do you go after other gods this is a contention in the broader jewish world believing that anyone even a any one of my ethnic cousins self-included uh, that has belief in yeshua as the messiah believing what scripture says about him that he is, in fact, God come in the flesh, has gone after other gods. That's number one. Number two, how do we today go after other gods? Well, what does Yeshua say in Matthew 6, 33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Okay. Now, what is an other god? An other god has always been taught in the church. I've heard it countless times when I was in the church. People today on the pulpit, pastors all over the place, will continue to teach, rightfully so, that when you place anything before Yeshua, that becomes a God, and you are pursuing other gods. 
So let's go back for a moment and repeat what we have continually repeated on each and every one of these videos is that we understand that Rob is a brother. We understand that he loves Yeshua, who he calls Jesus. No issue there. We have a, and we do not go after the man. We go after the theology. We go after the doctrine. We go after the philosophy that is underlying because he is expressing, he is providing the standard typical or the stereotypical Western church response to negativity concerning the law, which it isn't, is always Torah. Now, as you said up front, Tony, there's a gross misunderstanding. So the other gods in context has nothing to do specifically about the Torah, although when you place anything before Yeshua, it does relate to it, but it's the application that's wrong again. And what Rob continues to do is to make an application, a teaching, and that is totally incorrect. You first have to understand the context of the verse. And then when you understand the context of the verse, and this is where you get into hermeneutics, which Rob knows, but he sadly abuses and misuses, then, and only then, do you make application. You don't make the application, and then, therefore, it becomes the teaching, as sure. has been for years and years with Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where it's going and making disciples is somehow going, and it stops there, and it's going to evangelize. That's not what is being said in the verse, but that's how it's been taught. Right. Please understand, everyone, the minute Rob says you can't be justified, no one is justified by the law. All right. Just like I was saying earlier and what Brother Mitch said a long time ago, what law are we talking about? Because if you're talking about the law of Moshe, yes, you can be justified by the law. Yeshua was justified by the law. He was sinless. The law showed him he was sinless. When you and I obey the law, we are justified by it. We are shown to be under a blessing. When we break the law, we now come under a curse. And now we know we need to repent and come back to doing the law, right? So if we get um, what Rob is, you know, misunderstanding and misapplying, no one is set right by the law. Yeah, the oral traditions, circumcision. Therefore, if you're not justified by that law, you are under a curse because it says, cursed is everyone who does not obey the book of the law. Everything written in the book of the law. We're supposed to obey it. We're supposed to walk in it. But when you violate it by doing oral traditions, that actually violate the Torah, now you come under a curse. And so, yes, he's quoting the Torah because they're breaking Torah. And he's reminding them, cursed is everyone who does not obey everything written in the book of the law. It's very simple. Very simple. Um, Romans 2 says it's not the hearers of the Torah that are justified. It is the doers of Torah that are justified. You've got to have the right attitude about what the Torah is. Amen. And when you're breaking it, they were worshiping other gods, just as Brother Mitch said, breaking the Torah. That's where the curses come in. Under that context, Paul is bringing it back into this context of circumcision. Doesn't matter how you're breaking it. When you're breaking it, the curse comes. Whether you're worshiping other gods, whether you're putting a heavy, a heavy yoke, on the Gentiles that nobody was supposed to do, that God never even put a yoke on them in that way. So yeah, Rob is just, boom, he's just off in left field, you know, unfortunately with the bad hermeneutics, not that 
like like Brother Mitch said, not that Rob is a bad person, but the hermeneutics that he has abandoned has left him out there. He's way out here in left field now. There's another issue that I believe is brought into this um, very likely unknowingly. Uh, the definition that is that I believe is still taught within the Western church for justification is just as if I've never sinned. Now, when you hear that, well, that right. would relate to, in some fashion, salvation. So do you, do you now see or can it click in your mind how justification relates to salvation and how it has crept into the church somehow that if you keep Torah, observe Torah, obey Torah, attempt doing any of the commands and don't keep them all, don't observe them all, don't obey them all, then somehow you can not have salvation. But who, what people, what body has only taught that Jewish people are attempting to earn their salvation by keeping the Torah or to remain in salvation by keeping the Torah. Hint, it wasn't anyone who's Jewish. <laughs> Let's get back to the video. <laughs> are spelled out in detail in Deuteronomy 28. So Paul's reminding the Galatians about what the Torah says, that those who live under the law had a literal curse hanging over their heads. Yahweh set before them a blessing, of course, but also a curse if they didn't obey. So they were always aware that if they didn't keep the commandments, there were curses that would follow. And the Old Testament records Israel's continuous inability to keep that law, to, to keep that covenant. In fact, okay. So is that true today? If we don't follow the commandments today, I mean, isn't that taught? <laughs> isn't that taught today? I mean, I've, I've been in many Western Christian services, you know, talking about blessings and cursings and how to get these cursings off of you and how to get back to the Bible and, 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 and all of that. And, you know, we got deliverance sessions and get these curses off of us because even though you're a believer in Yeshua, when you disobey his commands, we deal with curses, generational curses. We we go through all this all this stuff. So, you know, he's acting like this is just a uh, you know an old covenant thing, curses and blessings. No, it doesn't change when you disobey. Go ahead. Here, here's what he's doing again. He's saying that Torah is not for us, meaning Christians. Yet he's going to the Torah and he's using the Torah as his teaching. So if you say that it's not for me, then you're starting, then you only have a condensed Bible of Matthew through Revelation. But you have a problem because when you get to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture did not mean what is commonly referred to as the New Testament because it was not in circulation. Right. So what was Shaul referring to? The stuff that Rob is saying is not for us today. The whole body of Tanakh. Right. It was, it, it was right. Israel's choice, right? It was Israel's choice not to obey. It wasn't that they didn't have the ability or that, you know, I was telling someone on, um, on Rob's site the other day, you know, he kept coming at me, coming at me. I am like, um, well, you know, listen, uh, Darn it, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um when it comes to when it comes to the laws, you know, does God set you up for failure? Because he kept I know what I know what I was trying to say. He kept saying, nobody can do the law, nobody can do the law. So I kept saying, so what you're saying is God sets you up to fail and then punishes you for failing because he made it impossible, and now he gets to punish you and throw you in hell for all eternity because. He he made you do something you could never do. What kind of God is that? This is this is the misunderstanding of covenants that a lot of Christians have. Unfortunately, it's because of the preaching out there. Um, mm -hmm. th 
So Abraham, if you have the faith of Abraham, then you can walk as he did in Genesis 26, 5, where it said he obeyed all of the commandments, all of the statutes and ordinances. And then you look at Yochanan the Immerser's parents in Luke chapter 1. It says they were righteous, obeying all of the commandments. They were blameless. This doesn't mean you walk sinlessly. All right. The covenant is set up for you to walk in repentance. You are to walk in repentance. Nobody has ever said walking in repentance is not a new covenant thing. It is a covenant thing of all covenants. So again, Rob, this is why you're off. This is why you just keep moving, moving down the wrong path on this. But what's, you know, the overall context here in 27 and 28 is where are we in Torah and many times in synagogue right uh, what we have to do is we have to take a step back and ask that very question where are we okay what what happened how did we get to this point and then put ourselves into the scripture and have a attempt to have a better understanding but you can or rather you can't if you divorce yourself and continue to use a 2023 mindset. Right. It will not work. No. So the, the context is here you have the second generation. And right here, they're, they're going to enter into the land. This is Moses third of three sermons. That's why uh, Deuteronomy is called Devarim, words. It's his third message. And he's laying it out there. Hey, and it's basically my paraphrase. Hey, guys, uh, our forefathers messed up. Okay? And we, we don't want you to do that. So here you go. This is the yardstick. If you maintain the yardstick, yeah, you're going to fail. But remember... We have the tabernacle, and we still have the ability to make offerings. And no, this I'm not going to cheap grace, which is taught in the church or espoused in the church anyway. Many don't understand what it's really all about. But even back then, in biblical times, when you messed up, you had the ability through the five different offerings to go and make yourself by drawing near to Hashem, to make yourself right with him, to be justified, okay, mm -hmm. through an atonement, a covering, like a Band-Aid. It didn't remove it. It just covered it. That's why it's called the Day of Coverings. Leviticus 16. Mm -hmm. And yes, when Yeshua came, he removed the overall band-aid not for our personal sins, plural, but for the sin singular act it was because israel continually broke the covenant they just could not keep the law that yahweh decided in his mercy to make a new covenant with his people so Whoa. 600 years before jesus all right absolutely wrong because it huh. It was always in Yah's plan to make that covenant with Yeshua. Everything is an ascending up, an ascending upward. Okay, the covenant that is made through the blood of Yeshua, that has, whether Israel, no matter what Israel did, that was already in the plan. <laughs> that was already the plan. It wasn't because Israel failed that that didn't become the plan. No, that was already always the plan. It's the shadow pointing us to the reality. I mean, that's true. Very, e very true. Even that's if Israel did it perfectly, if they did the covenant of Sinai perfectly, we would still need the blood of Yeshua. 
we would still need it. Because the, the Sinai covenant wasn't meant for you to walk sinlessly. It wasn't set up to, to it wasn't to operate at that level. All right. He already knew you'd be making mistakes. The issue with Israel wasn't so much that they were sinning and occasionally breaking the Torah. It was they were lacking repentance. They kept going after the other gods. They lusted and desired after them. Hey, you're, you're right now in the kingdom, I make mistakes. I sin all the time. And when I repent and come back, the Lord welcomes me. He wel He knows I am not been. I have not been perfected yet. Until Yeshua returns and I get this new body, then and only then through the work of Yeshua alone, I will have come into that uh, glorified body that he will give me. But see, this is all just part of his plan. This is why Rob, again, not understanding covenants and what each covenant is for, the purpose, the goal, what it's supposed to teach us, how we're in training. You know what I mean? We're in training right now. Uh, to, you know, we're being tested. We are to endure to the end to be saved. And so we are enduring our trust and faith in Yeshua. But yeah, it's so, always been this way. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. So, so, so what, what is supposed to happen after we come to a point of personal salvation? What, what, so what, what's supposed to, well, at that point for, and for the rest of our natural life, yeah, we go through the process of sanctification. Sure. Conforming to his image, being transformed, right? Yes. Amen. Amen. And, and that's, and how do we, how do we do that? How, how do we know what to follow? How right. do we know what it is to do and not to do? Right, the Torah. The stuff, yeah. the stuff that is, Rob says, is not for today, or these brand new ten hundred and a uh, thousand fifty new commands that are all based upon something that's not for Christians, as Rob would say today. Right. Which one would it be? Right. Okay. It. it yeah. See, I mean, you know, we get back to the Book of Hebrews. You, you know that Moshe. Um, they they made a copy of the heavenly tabernacle. This is a copy. It's not it's not the heavenly tabernacle. It's not the officiating where Yeshua will be doing right in the throne room of the Father. There, that is the perfected. That one can only be done by a perfected high priest who has never sinned. So you know this whole idea of the Sinai covenant. It was set up as the shadow to point you to the realities in the heavenly realm. But we knew he knew Aaron would sin. He knew Moshe would sin and they can't cleanse themselves. So he didn't set them up to fail. He set them up to be able to show you and accomplish it. Now, they chose to fail. The, the later leadership of Israel chose to fail. But that didn't mean the covenant failed or the covenant was not perfect. Remember that Psalm 19 says that the law is perfect, converting the soul. There's nothing wrong with the law. All right. It, it does the job, which is what it was designed to do. But it cannot give you a glorified body. It cannot wash you clean. Only the blood of Yeshua can wash you clean. But that doesn't mean the Torah goes away. And also, very similarly, Similarly, uh, Tony, uh, it also indicates the way to walk. Right. And it's not just about exposing sin, which it does. There's more to it than Torah. And you can do a word search, and I urge everybody to do this. Now, look at... Um, 70 faces of Torah. Google it. Yeshua is called the royal diadem. Yeshua is the living Torah. And it is a tree of life to those who hold it. And all, all of those who hold it are blessed. Its ways are ways of pleasantness. Yeah. Amen. There's nothing wrong about Torah except 
when there is an attempt to set up rules and regulations, rites and rituals, which is the, in essence, the legalistic perversion of doing so. Yep. So if you guys know the word halakha, you know that that word means a way of walking, how to walk. That's not just, that's not just something in rabbinic Judaism. That is something in Western Christianity. Just look at the doctrines of men that would in in Jewish culture, in Jewish understanding, when they see the, the Catholic doctrines, the Lutheran doctrines, that's halakha, they think, for those people, their way of walking out what they believe. And of course, they will judge that as violating the scriptures in many ways, right? So looking at halakha, all the denominations have halakha. They have doctrines which try to teach you how to walk. But now we all have to study to show ourselves approved and say, is that way of walking the way of walking the Bible tells us to do? That's where you have to study for yourself. So let, let's let's take a minute and let's go to John 14, 6. And Yeshua says in English, I am the way, I am, uh, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So in Hebrew, it would be, Ani Haderek, I am the way. I am the truth. Ani Haemet. And I am the life. Ani Ha Hayim. So Yeshua says, I'm the way to walk. I'm the way. And there is no other way. I'm the only way. And the only way to the Father is you have to come through me. That's right. And you have to do it my way. And my way is, here's the Torah. <laughs> this is how you walk. And if you want to throw out the Torah, you have free will to do so. And you might very well become part of the kingdom. I'm not judging anyone's salvation here. All I'm saying is, if you do so, then what does Yeshua say himself? In Matthew 5, 19, or 18 and 19, that those who do basically will be the least in the kingdom. Yep. So there, there has to be, and, and if there has to be, and the, the Western church has to wake up. But if the Western church will not receive instruction, believing that any time that somebody is talking about Torah, that it's a bad thing, will not listen, will not receive just, oh, poo-poo. You know how that goes. Someone's talking to you and you get you poo-poo them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you believe what that guy said? It's never going to happen. But there will be a time, and there is a time coming. Yeshua is going to return. He's going to establish his bona fide kingdom here on earth. And what does it say in Isaiah 2? And the word of the Lord goes forth from Jerusalem. And the Torah goes forth from Zion. Mm -hmm. Amen. Word of the Lord. What, what is that? The word of the Lord. What is the Torah? Come on. Anybody who understands basic Bible understands that is when, not for now, although it is coming, it will be established when Yeshua returns. Rob would agree with Rob would agree with the principle of Isaiah 2, but he's got a major problem here because he thrown in out Torah. So okay. I'm going to throw out Torah now, today, but yet somehow Torah is going to come back and going to basically be the ruling document. 
oh, I get it. That's dispensation theology, isn't it, Tony? It is. Jesus, the prophet Jeremiah wrote, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And, and catch this, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So God is the faithful husband and Israel was an unfaithful bride. And guess what? Christians today are no better than Israel. No one can keep the law perfectly. We're all cursed. As Paul says in Romans 3.23, for all... I guess John, uh, the Mercer's parents, didn't get the memo on that. I guess they, 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 good thing they didn't listen to Rob because by, by the proclamation of the scriptures, they kept it all. But again, you got to understand the context. That doesn't mean they walk sinlessly. The Torah has a means of walking in repentance. What was the biggest thing Israel, when, when Yahweh got mad at him and said, I don't, I hate your sacrifices. I don't like your sacrifice. I don't desire them or whatever. It was because their hearts weren't in it. They weren't walking in repentance. They still lusted after the other gods. But it wasn't that Torah was impossible for them to do or come back and uh, repent and come back to the Lord. I'm so glad he brought out this translation of Jeremiah 31 because it uses the word husband. So question, when you see husband being used, what does that really mean? That means that there is a marriage and there is a wife. So who is the husband? Who is the right. wife? Right. Now, the new covenant, okay, it's really renewed and we can get involved with all of that uh, individual wordplay back and forth, etc. But in the context, what is really going on here with what is called, as Rob referred to, scripture refers to often as the law of Moses. And that's why he uses it, which is a bad word anyway. But back to my point. So when the, because of the golden calf or the molten calf, that incident in Exodus 32, what was the actual covenant that was broken? Was it Torah? No. Was it a covenant made at Sinai? Yes. But what is the actual name of the covenant which they broke referred to right here in this scripture, Jeremiah 31, 32. It is the marriage covenant referred to in Hebrew as the ketubah. It's the terms of the obligations between husband and wife. Husband is supposed to do this. The wife is supposed to do that. We see this. <laughs> we, we've said it before. Golden opportunity to explain it again. Chapter 20, what is commonly referred to as the Ten Commands or the Ten Commandments. They're not suggestions, especially number four. Those That is the summary of the entirety of the marriage covenant. Now, where do we find the expansion, the actual meat and potatoes, if you will, of the terms of the marriage covenant? We find it in Exodus 21 through 23. And then through in Exodus 24, from verses uh, down to verse 11, what do we have? We see that all of this that had just taken place is now called the Book of the Covenant. And what happens to the Book of the Covenant? It's sprinkled with blood, blood splattered on the people. And where does the Book of the Covenant go? In the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> okay? So now today, 
where is Torah written? Right here and right here. Okay? Regardless of whether or not someone actually knows, acknowledges, believes, it's written in your mind and upon your heart. That is the essence of the difference between what is referred to as the older covenant and the newer covenant. Yes, you see here in 24 of Exodus, there's sprinkling and shedding of blood. That's the ratification of the covenant. What do we see Yeshua doing? Hanging on the tree on Nisan 14 of that year. The beginning of the renewed covenant, the shedding of blood. It's very simple. It's very elementary. But when you have a predisposed position and you always believe that this thing, the first 39, don't apply to me, and we're only under grace, we're not under this law thing, you have a major problem. And he didn't change brides. <laughs> he, he made it with the same bride. Right. right? And, and there Lord, is no Lord change. <laughs> right. <laughs> Amen. So let, let me let, let's just throw in uh, for a moment, Tony. How many how many brides did uh, Hashem marry at Sinai? <laughs> yeah, there was only one. Only one. So. Yeah, we, we, yeah. we talked about that when we walked through Only. Roman a, a while back at length. Yeah. <laughs> and, and fall short of the glory of God. So here in Galatians, Paul is showing how all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. And he continues, verse 11. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. So there again is... All right, let's stop here. The word the should be in italics here. It is evident that no one is justified before God by law. What law have we just been talking about? Works of law. No one is justified by the oral traditions of circumcision. For the righteous shall live by emunah, by faith which it's, goes back to the heart of the issue and it goes back to the actual scripture source is Habakkuk 2 4. Yeah. yeah. Boy, it really it really smooths it out when you begin to go back. I mean, I should have remembered what you said, Brother Mitch, at the beginning of this series. And then when my friend re, um, told me about, you know, looking up the definite article and everything. Um, I mean, obviously, when you stick the law of Moses in every place that you 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 see the word law, you come up with roadblocks. You come up with roadblocks because now you become inconsistent in the context. And then when you realize, OK, it's got to be something else. It's got to be a perverted way of the law of Moshe. There's still some bumps in the road like it's it's much smoother. It's going through. It's making the context be cohesive. But then when you realize that it's specifically talking about oral traditions, boy, it just smooths out the road. It's smooth sailing and you just keep driving right through the proper context and you just you just keep going. So, yeah, it's uh, it's really cool. It is Paul's common refrain in this book. No one is justified before God by the law. And he quotes from Habakkuk 2.4. The righteous shall live by faith, which of course also brings to mind Genesis 15, which we just looked at, where Abraham's faith made him righteous. And the subtext here is that, hey, these aren't new ideas, guys. This is all stuff that comes from our own Hebrew scriptures. And Paul is really going to draw out that distinction between faith and law. That means it has never changed. 
The faith of Abraham was expected to be there all throughout the Sinai covenant, and they had the ability to do it if they chose to do it. And there were righteous. Look at the prophets. The prophets walked in righteousness. Go to Ezekiel 18, where it talks about uh, how the righteous, what will happen to them. And if the wicked person turns from his wickedness and begins to walk in righteousness. Remember, walking in the law is walking in righteousness. And so you are justified by the law because you're walking in faith. The righteous shall live by amuna, by faithfulness, walking in the covenant, faithful covenant. That's what Abraham did. Abraham was already walking in, in faithfulness even before he got the covenant, uh, you know, and <clears throat> before he got circumcision. So uh, it's just a matter of context. You know, I'm as, as we're getting into this, uh, Tony. Well, I'll, I'll save it for a closing comment. Okay. But the law is not of faith. Wow! Don't miss. The law is not of faith. Not the law of Moses. The law is not of faith. The what? The work of the law. The circumcision, oral traditions, is not of faith. Walking in the law of Moses is walking in faith. Faithfulness. See how this begins to smooth out now? It, it, it No more bumps in the road. It just goes real smooth, and you're not contradicting the words of Yeshua. You're not contradicting Paul in, uh, in other places in his letters. Oh, it sounds good to just put it law of Moses right here in chapter 3 if you're not looking anywhere else, if you're not comparing any other words of Paul in any other place, or the words of Yeshua, or the covenant, how the covenant's supposed to operate, or the life of Abraham. It'll look good right there. But then when you get outside of chapter three, now you've got all kinds of roadblocks. So, yeah, but the law, it shouldn't be the law because the is not in, it's not in the Greek. It's implied. But law is not of faith. Which law? The law of circumcision for salvation, the, that oral tradition there. The, the only thing, Tony, that it does... Uh, have an issue with is that it will uh, point to the Western church and again, their errant theology, because it will be in total conflict of what they believe and what they teach. Right. But is that scripture or is that the traditions of men? Hmm. Right. Right. We'll leave that one right there. <laughs> now, now I know what some of you are thinking. He, he uses the term law is not of faith, and then he quotes the Torah. Then he quotes, what is that, Leviticus 19.18 or 18.19? I can't remember which one. So the law is not of faith, meaning the oral tradition of circumcision, but the one who does them shall live by them. He's just repeating the just shall live by faith. In other words, those who follow the Torah— those who do them shall live by them. Those are the faithful ones. Those are the ones walking in faith. So, again, you got to understand the context. It gets yes. really. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. It's really interesting because the the scripture that you were looking for there that he's actually mm -hmm. quoting is Leviticus eighteen five. Oh, eighteen five. Yes, thank you. I couldn't remember exactly where it was at. Okay, and so uh, you are to observe my laws and rulings. If a person does them, he will have listened to this carefully. Please look it up for yourself in any one of your English versions that you care to use. It will have the same thought running through. You are to observe, keep, obey my laws and rulings, my commands and my judgments is basically what the Hebrew is there. If a person does them, they will have life through them. Who says this? I am Adonai. Ani Adonai. Yep. Not me. Yep. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Yeah. And and Leviticus 18.5 is quoted a few more times throughout throughout the New Covenant scriptures. I mean, it's 
there's there's definitely a few more times that it's quoted, bringing you back to that point. Amen. Miss that. The law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. <laughs> Look at that. Another quote from the Torah. And here he's citing Leviticus 18.5 to draw a stark contrast. The law is not of faith. They aren't the same thing. Why? Wow. See the poor hermeneutics, everyone? The law, <laughs> the law of Moshe is of faith because the one who does them shall live by them. Because it wasn't given by man. Man didn't give it. it. It is directly from the mouth of Yah. It's from Yeshua. Amen. That's why it is of faith. Because they command you to obey it. And as Brother Mitch said, through that comes life. Why? Well, because the law is based on doing. Leviticus says that the one who does these commandments shall live by them. But faith, on the other hand, is based on believing and trusting. See, here we go. Faith is just believing. That's all it is. It's just, hey, it's just believing. But faith without works is dead. It is not the hearer of the Torah that is justified. The one that just believes. Oh, yeah, that's a good word. Good word, preacher. Preach it. Good word. Yeah, that's a good word there. It's the doer of the Torah that is justified because they are walking in faith. It's, it's amazing. No. The, uh, and so what you have there is all you got to do, this this is the, the gospel of evangelicism. Come and believe and you'll have eternal life. Come and believe and you'll go to heaven. Now what? Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. You're going to have them. Really? No? Okay. Were you really? Did you really have? I don't know. I'm asking this rhetorical question. Did you really have a, a real salvation experience? Are you truly now In the word, trying to get to know Hashem better. Are you, is your life reflective of Yeshua? What would your husband or wife say about you? What about your co-workers? I often wonder, Brother Mitch, if, um, you know, the easy believism, as we might call it, that easy, you know, evangelical believism, salvation message and everything. I often wonder, could that be the strong delusion that we've been warned about, um, that e even the elect, if they didn't know the truth, they could be they could be drawn away. They could be fall into it. But the elect, those who know the word will know that the just shall live by faith, meaning faithfulness, that it's not just easy believism, right? I, I just wonder, just something to think about. I wonder if that's the strong delusion that that God will send and people will believe the lie. All I got to do is believe. I just got to believe Jesus died for my sins. That's all I got to do is believe. I often wonder. <sighs> and no, we're not saying... We're saved by works. Just let's get that clear. We're not saying you are saved by works because that's excluding the work of Yeshua when you say that. No. Sometimes Hebrew roots teachers will try to take this nuanced approach and claim, hey, it takes faith to obey the law. So they'll conclude that faith is obedience to the law. But Paul blows that idea out of the water here. Actually, no, Paul falls in line with that. Faith will cause you to walk in faithfulness. When you truly have a love for Yahweh, truly have a love for Yeshua, you will desire to do the right thing. You will hate sin. You will turn from sin. He quotes Leviticus to show that God requires the doing of the law, not merely believing in it. And therein lies the rub. Since no one can keep or do the law perfectly, 
we're all cursed. And for our Hebrew roots friends who tend to marginalize or even reject Paul and claim that his teachings clash with what Jesus taught, think about this. How many times do we read about Jesus saying something like, your faith has made you well? We find that at least a dozen times in the Gospels, but we never hear him saying, your keeping of the law has made you well. For example, Matthew 9, when the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years touched the fringe of his garment, does Jesus turn around and say, take heart, daughter, your works have made you well? What if she wouldn't have grabbed the garment? What was, what was the action of her faith? If I reach out and grab him, I will be healed. It, it's amazing because, yes, what is rightfully and commonly taught is she had faith. But what people do not understand is she understood the very obscure to many prophecy in Malachi. The son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. There was a messianic expectation. And the people knew that whoever the Messiah would be, whenever he would come, one of the things that he would do, would he would heal. Now, there's, there's many other things, but one of the names of Messiah given long before Yeshua walked the earth was son of righteousness was a messianic title only related to the Messiah. This woman with the issue of blood understood that through her works <laughs> because of her faith <laughs> Right. That she knew who he was because she understood the son of righteousness will come with healing in his wings. And that's the tzitzit, my friends. Amen. Amen. Well, this is a good place for us to, to stop. We'll have uh, 10 minutes left uh, when we return. We'll sh we should be able to wrap that up on our next on our next time together, but wow, what a, what a, what a filled uh, episode we just had here with a lot of great information for you to go and study and test what we are saying. Please go and test what we are saying and compare it to what Rob is teaching. Um, and on that note, Tony, uh, we come to this parasha, Shemini, which means the eighth. And this uh, parasha brings us to the dead center of the Torah in words. So if you counted all of the words from Genesis 1-1 to the end of the Torah, you would find right here in Leviticus 10-16, two Hebrew words, darosh, darash, and it's translated in to English, Seek diligently. And we are to search out for our own selves, which is interesting because Yeshua refers to this in the Via Hafta in um, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verse 7, when he says, And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk to them when you sit in your house when you rise up when you walk by the way and when you lie down mm -hmm. and what does that mean and i i say this often in synagogue this is homeschooling this is where homeschooling comes from it's 24 hours seven days a week 365 days a year and 366 in a leap year. This is where it is. How much do we spend time in the word and how much time are we taking to teach the next generation, whether it is our own biological children or our spiritual children, regardless of which one, 
it's all about discipleship. Mm-hmm. That's where the road meets the road every single time. And that's that's why we do this, everyone. That's why we press so hard on watching some other videos the way we do, the way other people teach with what is out there and why we do what we do. This is the thing that is lacking. Belief in Yeshua is not lacking. Belief that he died for your sins on the cross. Um, People have wonderful worship services where they're worshiping the Lord and singing and dancing and so forth. Where things are lacking in the body is discipleship so that we can live these things out. That's the biggest lack that we see in the body, which, which is holding us from coming together and unifying. It really is. Because, I mean, you can get all kinds of denominations to come together and worship. If it's just a worship session and we're just doing worship songs, I don't care about your denomination. We're worshiping the same God. We're, we're, you know, so a lot of people will come together. That's no problem. But when we we get into discipleship and we start talking about the scriptures and how to walk them out, that's when the rubber meets the road right there. And that's where the rub comes in. Um, And we need to learn how to live with one another and disciple one another. That's that's the key. Amen, everyone. Well, it is Friday, so we hope you guys will have a wonderful Shabbat and uh, a counting of the days, counting of the Omer tonight. Uh, It will be Omer number nine as we enter into Shabbat tonight. So we hope you have a a wonderful Shabbat time um, and keep pushing forward in the kingdom. Amen. Keep the goal is Yeshua. He is who we strive for. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom.